To begin with, how many of you here have heard of the UCGHI advocacy initiative? Just raise your hands. Okay, pretty good actually. Well, most of them are insiders. So. Um, but what this is is really a very unique program. And what it does is it trains student and faculty on the tools necessary to really advocate for global health funding at the federal level. So what, they're tr what essentially the initiative is doing is mobilizing all these different UC stakeholders that are primarily student-led to really impact and uh, influence uh, funding decisions that are on global health at the federal level. And that's really important because you know, collectively we can show the importance of global health and really make sure that this form of funding is protected. So this really impacts everyone in this room and is something that uh, we should all support. Uh, and of course, because companies spend millions of dollars on lobbying, uh, you can't really go at this alone. So this initiative was partnered with the Kyle House Group, which is a DC-based consulting firm uh, that really focuses on nonprofits. And uh, they put together an action plan, a policy strategy, uh, to really train students and tell them, you know, what type of pain points you can look at, what type of advocacy uh, activities are really impactful. And this is a training program that happened just last year. So um, the outputs of this program are really remarkable just in one year. Uh, 40 students from across nine UC campuses, including UC Hastings, important because they're a law school, uh, participation across a whole spectrum of students, including undergraduates, uh, professional graduate degrees, and even postdocs. And uh, our speakers today represent a, a diverse group as well, undergraduates, an alumni, and a master's student. So a lot of participation from a lot of people in different uh, areas of the UC system. Activities, which each of our speakers will talk about. Uh, Millie will be talking about a letter writing campaign uh, as a first speaker. Um, uh, Mariati is going to be talking about uh, community outreach and education. And then Anshal is going to be talking about writing an op-ed. And if you think writing an op-ed is easy, it's not. But he'll give you kind of uh, an overview of some of the activities that they've done, uh, really you know, transforming research into op-eds that can impact uh, the general public more broadly. And of course, the main issue here is to ensure that there's sustained or increased global health funding uh, for uh, you know, the UC system, but also in nationwide. And so this table right here uh, shows some really interesting uh, meetings that they've had with congressional leaders. And as you can see, there's some big names of people here that are directly influencing healthcare access, equality, and social determinants. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, the minority leader of the House, is up here, and people like Kamala Harris. So they're really going to people that have influence and can have an impact on our macro global health environment. Um, so to just start, I wanted to tell you about uh, my own experience advocating for global health and also graduate research as part of a UC system-wide uh, global uh, uh, research advocacy day that the, U university, uh, the university office of the president runs, U UCOP. And this was, we're going to juxtapose this with some of the student discussion. Uh, this is actually a yearly initiative that goes on right now. Uh, every year, two students, uh, two graduate students from each UC system are chosen to join with their graduate deans and go to Sacramento and basically tell state legislatures how important uh, graduate research is to the health of California and its economic progress. So this happens every year. Uh, I'm not sure if many of you are aware of it, but it's really you know, a mobilization effort to get state legislatures to understand how important the UC is and, of course, to protect our funding. Um, so the one thing about this uh, event that's really unique is that we're really prepared in a lot of policy kind of uh, advocacy kind of tools. So I, I participated in 2011, and uh, I participated with another colleague from theater. She was doing work on Burning Man. So a very interdisciplinary type of approach uh, to this policy advocacy. And there's uh, former uh, graduate dean Kim Barrett who accompanied us there, and they asked us to um, document our day, like document the day of a graduate student. And they wanted to pick a picture that was most compelling. So for my picture, my son, uh, Say, was about three months old. And you know we were basically up all night. And he's on a boppy pillow here while I'm doing research. So that was the, the picture that they chose uh, to, imp to basically tell legislators, hey, these researchers are human beings as well. Um, and then what they did was they put all these posters of all our work from all the UC's campuses uh, up here at the, at the Capitol Hill. And um, you know, so legislatures knew that we were doing really good work. And the main takeaways I actually had from, from this uh, experience, which we'll talk about in the student uh, discussions, is one, 
oftentimes you get a briefing back it and you are going to see a state legislature and you think you're going to see them, but you actually don't get to see them. You either wait for like 20 minutes or so and no one shows up and you oftentimes just meet with the staffer or a senior staffer. And a lot of times they have no idea who you are and why you're there. And so you have to be very flexible in your policy advocacy kind of toolkit to figure out what your talking points should be and what they're interested in. And second of all, especially at the state legislature level, we, we experienced that a lot of legislators don't know anything about higher education, nor do they think it's important. So for example, we had one discussion with a, with a legislature and he asked me, what are you doing at the UC? And I said, I'm getting a PhD in global health. And he said, that takes about a year, right? And I said, no, it actually takes four to five years. And he said, why would you want to be in school that long? And well, in retrospect, maybe I, I might think about it. But um, you have to break through that dynamic of people not understanding that research oftentimes is very important to the health of a local economy or national economy and really progresses the state. So coming in with the assumption that a, a lawmaker really values research or potentially you know, global health research that's something you have to overcome and it's not easy. And that's something um, we'll be talking about right now with our first case study from uh, Millie Patel, who'll be talking about a letter writing campaign, which is a very powerful way that we influence policy even now, um, even in this digital age. And she'll be talking about that effort to really make sure that global health funding is protected. So thanks, come on, come up Millie. Hi everybody, good morning. Uh, my name is Millie Patel, I'm a second year undergraduate student at UCLA and I'm gonna be talking about our letter running campaign for the UCGHI Advocacy Initiative. And initially, we first got this budget. Uh, it first dropped, granted it changed throughout the process, but our first point of action was from this specific chart right here. And it was quite concerning to see that we had this overall 26% drop in funding from the FY17 budget in general. And looking at it, you can see that PEPFAR was down by 11%, malaria was all the way down, but there was 0%, and then uh, along with family planning, 100%. So certain places changed, certain places were completely cut. And that was really concerning to us as students because the US has such a huge investment in global health in general if we were to decrease the funding that we provide for it, the programs that we do. It's a threat to international stability and security and global security as well. So we got the FY18 budget request and we saw that the funding was cut by 26%, as I mentioned, from the FY17 levels. And our first, our goal was to get it back to FY17 levels in the FY18 budget. And to address this funding cut, we launched a overall letter writing campaign, which is right here on this Google Doc. Uh, it was a very simple Google document that students were able to fill out. And we asked their voting district, their name, what school, what their affiliation is with the school. And we had two letters addressed specifically. And one of the letters is to congressmen and representatives who were supportive of global health. And we emphasized why their support is continued and needed. And it helped address programs such as PEPFAR, the REACH Act, and all these other programs that the United States has created in order to provide a larger stake in the world's overall development and improvement in um, healthcare. And there was another letter addressed to those who are not supportive of global health. And we tried to really target the fact that Global health is, a, as it is in the word global, it is not a domestic or international issue. It is everyone involved. And to, to really highlight the fact that investing in other countries is also investing in your own domestic health as well. Because a lot of legislators, when they, we speak with them, they're asking how is this going to benefit us as a, in the United States? And we have our own domestic health care issues. Why should we be concerned about what's going on somewhere else in the world? And you have to really, that's a, a large issue that we face when speaking to these representatives, is convincing them with the fact that investing in another nation, because illness has no barriers. It can come into our own, at our own boundaries, and we can be affected to a greater extent if we're not prepared to what we want to do. So that was our letter writing campaign, and we were able to garner nearly 4,000 signatures through this campaign. And it was all through social media outreach, uh, mass emails, word of mouth, and we got signatories from non-California voters as well as mostly California voters all across the uh, California um, system as well. And it was largely successful for its first pilot program, and it's showed us that it is a very grassroots-based outreach method, but if you're able to garner 4,000 people to support global health funding, just in the California system alone, when we have the largest delegation in the Congress as right now, it shows that global health is something that we need to be really concerned about as advocates, both students, faculty, researchers as a whole. 
And we also, I was a director of the community outreach program for the UCGHI Advocates Initiative, and we had 14 different community engagement events going on. Something as large as this, which happened at UC Berkeley, they had an expert panel organized by students, and on November 7th, these advocates hosted an expert panel with an inter interdisciplinary perspective on global health in general. And the speakers were Dr. Prada, Dr. Potts, Dr. Smith, and Dr. Cohen, which I believe is right here. And they were able to host a facilitated discussion. 70 people attended, it was posted to social media. And this was one of the few events that we had. We even had simple events such as flyering in a very concentrated student population areas of different UC campuses for things such as bump day or talking about even domestic healthcare issues such as the ACA and all these other things going on. And as advocates, we made it a point to not only show that we're concerned about global health in investment, but also we're concerned about domestic health issues as well. And we tried to bring that perspective to everyone that being concerned about what's going on in the United States as well as anywhere else in the world is important to do for the the security of the improvement of health overall. And social media was a huge aspect of this advocacy initiative. Many of us, we actually met for the first time in person today. We've been working via video call for the past couple months, and social media was a huge proponent in us trying to be able to show our initiative and get more um, interest in the program as a whole. And one of the projects that I launched was Humans of Global Health, modeled after the popular New York um, Humans of Global Health, I mean, Humans of New York series. And we brought in faculty and researchers, and we just interviewed them, asking them questions about their experience in global health and their journey. And this is what, an example from that. And we had Dr. Coates interviewed as well. And it was really inspiring to talk to these individuals and students and researchers about this program. And we posted on our own personal profiles with hashtags and appropriate taggings of accounts of different things going on in the United States, such as the Paris Climate Agreement, when the ACA, when the healthcare issues were going on, they're debating that as well. And it was very powerful, Reach, we were able to see our stats and we reached thousands of people just via Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And as an advocacy initiative that we're not able to physically meet in person all too often, social media played a huge role in how we're able to go about our initiative. So to close my segment, I would like to say, uh, like us on Facebook, <laughs> the UCGHI advocacy, advocacy Initiative. You'll be able to get updates on what's going on, our steps moving forward. And if you're interested in getting involved as a student or as a faculty member, um, we will post updates on there. And I'd like to introduce a Marriotti Messenger who's going to be talking about um, educational outreach and campus-driven advocacy and organization. Thank you. Hello, good morning. This is Mariotti Messenger. I'm going to be talking about the um, educational outreach and community um, engagement that we have done at the Advocacy Initiative Program. All right, so before I begin talking about my experience, I want to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I was fortunate enough to travel to various countries. Um, I was born and raised in Indonesia for about 10 years, and then uh, moved to Los Angeles for a couple years, moved back to, I moved to Saudi Arabia and lived there for seven years, then came back to uh, the States to study biology at UC Santa Cruz. Um, but what was so important um, from traveling to all these places was the fact that we are all connected one way or another. Yes, there are language barriers, there are different cultures, different backgrounds, but we are all connected in, every, in one way or another. Um, for example, if one, if one, if one um, problem happens in another country, it will affect another aspect of another um, problem in a different country around the world. So just curious, a show of hands, who have read The Hot Zone by Richard Preston? Okay, quite a few, few of you. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, so for those of you who have read this book, you all know the severity and the importance of um, response towards an epidemic or um, an outbreak, such as the Ebola epidemic that happened a few years back. Um, the importance of this book that I read was the fact that it really highlights the fact that it requires interdisciplinary action in order to solve real world health issues. Um, so why global health? Why do we want to invest in global health? Um, and not in domestic health issues. A, the world is connected more than ever before. Like I said, 
if one reaction happens in another area, it's going to come back to you in another area as well. B, yes, we do need interdisciplinary action. Global health is an umbrella of many different fields, of many different aspects of um, different uh, expertise as you will, um, to solve these issues. You need, you, it's not just science. Most people, when they think of global health, they think of, oh, that's health, that's just science. I wouldn't be interested in that. No, there's economics, there's business, there's the politics, the, all of that is really into global health. And see, health is central to who we are and how we function. Um, what I mean is that we have to take care of this planet because we only have one home here. And if the environment that we're in is polluted and is, and is polluted and our oceans are acidic, that we have no water to drink, what is the purpose of us being here? We need to improve our um, planet as well as the healthcare overall in our planet. This is my perspective with the Global Health Institute Advocacy Initiative. Um, at UC Santa Cruz, my colleague and I, we established a um, tabling event at the 15th Annual Practical Activism Conference. And that one was, re that was a really uh, great event where we actually talked to many different students and faculty members about the program and really introduced what it means to invest in global health and why should students be really involved in global health. We received a possible collaborators and feedback um, since this is a really new program, and that was really helpful as well. Next, we did the public health education aspect of our program. We presented at the Citizen Science Forums at the Santa Cruz Public Library about the hepatitis A outbreak that happened recently that affected Los Angeles, Santa Cruz, and San Diego. We talked about the hepatitis A outbreak of the facts and the um, how would you prevent from this disease from spreading any further? Because what is the cause of fear? It's the unknown. So if you were to educate the public on the prevention aspects and the resources available where they can access to, you would reduce the amount of deaths and, and uh, reduce the spread of the disease as well. And an accomplishment of this event is that the video had over 5.9 thousand views and over 400 engagements on Facebook Live. So that was, that was amazing that I thought that was a personal accomplishment for myself. Um, and we, uh, we, led a, we led a panel as well with three healthcare professionals from the Santa Cruz Public Health Department. And they were really engaged with the audience. The audience really um, took it seriously and appreciated our work um, attending to the community. And um, also, we also collaborated with the Santa Cruz AIDS Project, where we volunteered and we, co and we conducted outreach over to particularly low-income communities and um, the homeless population as well, as they're um, mostly afflicted um, mostly because of the drug abuse. Um, and because of that, we formed a solid relationship with another community member, with another organization, and that made us stronger. And in terms of what is the future of this program, and what did I gain from this program? I believe that this program gave us a voice to address the global health issues around the world, and it really gave us a platform to build to hone our skills in communication and as well as knowing the federal level of global health and the economic side of it as well. It's not just a one-sided field. There's various aspects towards it as well. And also, UC Santa Cruz has a challenge. We do not have a dominant presence of public health or global health. Um, in our campus. We don't have a department, we don't have a program. And I did emphasize this in our previous events, um, and I'm happy to say that because of our grassroots advocacy work, we were able to have a talk on a possible um, global health minor in our campus. So that is a huge accomplishment, I think, from our advocacy work. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. And because of the global health work that I've done thus far, and because of the advocacy work that I've done, I was inspired, as well as my fiance, since he's here right now with me, <laughs> supporting me. Um, we decided to collaborate and initiate our own project called the GH Platform, as in Global Health Platform. It's an, on, it's an online system where we enable users to use this platform to really report healthcare issues and also environmental violations that um, real time, anytime, anywhere. So healthcare professionals can reach over to what is happening right now um, before uh, many lives are lost. So we're still working on it right now. We're developing a website, but we're hoping to build more on top of that. Also, I'm really looking forward to having my graduate degree in epidemiology since I'm very interested in disease dynamics and how data and statistics can tell you a lot more about the mysteries of a disease. Thank you. So when I was younger, when I was a boy, every weekend or so my parents would sit around or my family, we would sit around and we'd read the newspaper. Very old school, and so I would get the comics, my dad would get the sports, my mom would usually look into cooking and other things, and the opinion would be thrown aside. Because for us, news was about facts. There wasn't really much room for anything that was not factual, right? Um, so, okay, you had this case, somebody said something, did it really matter what that opinion was? So. As I grew older, I started paying attention to the world around me. I started paying more attention. And I think I realized that the world is a very big place, and the problems are bigger still. And what really makes a difference is the ability to have an impact and to make things better. And sometimes that means changing facts. And so today, I want to talk about advocacy and how we can use op-eds as a tool of advocacy to advocate for our beliefs and to make change. So opinion editorials. Opinion editorials are editorials about their opinions about any, anything really, anything that moves you. They could be about terminal plans, it could be about maternal health, it could be about so many different things. But essentially, it's a piece in order to make your voice heard. It's a piece through which your voice can be heard. And so the students in the UC GHI program each wrote an op-ed about something that was passionate, that they were passionate about. And so I'd like to go through some of their, uh, some of their op-eds and show you how to construct an effective op-ed using these student examples. So the first thing is to start with a hook. And so I'd like to read out one of the op-eds that some, one of the students wrote, and I'd like to show why this is effective. So when you were 10, did you know what hepatitis A was? Did your eyes and your skin turn yellow? Did your whole body ache? Were you scared? Were your parents scared? If you've been raised in America, your answers likely would be no. That caught my attention. I couldn't take my eyes away from this. And really, that's what your purpose is. When you're starting an op-ed, your goal is to grab your audience's attention right away. You know, for me, it was the comics, right? I would be looking at the comics, and if I saw something that even remotely started to bore me, I'd go on to the next one. And I approached op-eds in a slightly similar way. You need to make that first panel really interesting. And that means to start with the hook. So advocacy necessitates credibility. And a way to do that is through facts, figures, data. Just like you saw in the presenters today. Uh, Dr. Patel, he supported all of the statements he was making with these beautiful graphs and facts. And it was a way to really understand what the big problem was and understand the big picture. And so these are events in the real world. And you can support your argument with peer-reviewed publications and credible organizational work. And so the world's problems are too numerous to solve in just one op-ed. So you want to try to keep them fairly short and concise. Choose a point, advocate for that point. 
prefer to be clear rather than comprehensive, and really get down to the meat of what you mean. Make your point known. So in this piece, one of the authors was talking about universal access to education. And she made this point known in, by making it bold. Uh, another way you could do that is through italics, through special formatting. Make it so that line is something that grabs your attention. And after that, you could talk more about, you can expand more on that with facts and figures and other things. But it's, it's a way to, it's, it's a bookmark, essentially, in the narrative. And that's a place to start from. And at the end of the op-ed, make sure you end with a concrete call to action. And so I'd like to read one of these. And so at the end of this article, the author says, well, we've talked about these issues. How can we improve? And so without a doubt, we must increase our investment in women's and girls' health globally. The question now is where do we focus those funds to see the greatest return on investment? And here are three suggestions founded in research and experience. And after that, she went on to lay out those three points. So just to summarize, start with a hook, support your view with facts, focus on making a single point, end with a call to action, and aim for about 500 to 700 words. So now that you know how to write an op-ed, I encourage all of you, look around the world. What inspires you? What moves you? What are some facts that you are not happy with? This is the hub of advocacy. This is, we are trying to create change and do something different. So I really encourage you to all look around you, find something you are passionate about, and make change. Thank you.